As a lover of books, I really, really appreciate JLF. I love JLF. I come here every year. I attend sessions. The people, the vibrancy, the amount of different topics, the panels, the hospitality, the culture, everything. It's wonderful. I feel a deep sense of satisfaction that the literary scene in India is so vibrant and so alive. We've had writers from 15 Indian languages and uh, most 30 international languages. Jaipur Literary Festival is there so many brilliant things on at the same time that you can't choose what to go to. It's really fantastic. It's wonderful to be here. people be able to just listen to the writers for what they're having to say uh, and enjoy the festival. It's a privilege to be here and the diversity of the programming is great and the standard of the debate is, is very high as well. We learn so much when we're on the panel and we learn so much when we're in the audience too. Absolutely live from the Palace. I am coming from 2007, when I was 7 years from that year I am coming and I love so much, I meet so many authors and it's like amazing. It's really good to see the Jaipur youth, you know, getting so excited for this. passion of the people on stage. They're inspiring all these people. Such an incredible turnout to listen to all these people. I've come to this bookstore four or five times and every time I walk away with another book. I've been to festivals all over the world but I've never been to a festival that is anything like it. It is more, more enjoyable, more exciting, more vibrant and it's free. It crosses boundaries and limits and heritages. And that is brilliant. All the speakers, they made us so much clear and love for the literature more and more. And uh, they updated us that what's the new upcoming. And I'm thankful to JLF. And it's nice to see so many, especially young people, interested in literature. It's amazing to see how many of them just keep coming back and coming back and sitting through all the panels and taking down notes. It's a very great thing to have this festival in Jaipur. So we come here. We get a lot of knowledge, we can question our knowledge here. Around six sessions, in whether it's Samwa, the weather in Charbagh, everything together. Isn't it wonderful for each and every one to experience this? Especially the ones in school, to know that there is value in books and not always on the mobiles, sticking to it every time. Well, it is indeed the Kumbh of literature. Very pleased, particularly how the performance poetry has gone. It's, uh, it's something I think we've been weak on in the past. Um, we've had some very good sessions from the Arab world, some, some remarkable sessions from West Africa. And what I love about JLF is that it makes space for poetry. Poetry is not often given as much time and love as it gets here. <laughs> Our duty, as we see it, is to bring the world to India and India to the world. The only way to transform societies is through knowledge and through culture. And if you're able to make knowledge accessible to those who don't otherwise have access to it, that in itself is a great way of bringing about change. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of our festival directors, advisors, and my colleagues at Team Bukas, we welcome you all to the first Festival Directors Roundtable of 2021. As we gear up for the eighth edition of Jaipur Bookmark, JBM, held in parallel with the annual Jaipur Literature Festival virtually this year, we reinforce JBM's role as an important B2B segment aimed at developing and nurturing the business of books and literary and arts festivals across the world. This year, the festival will take place 
from 22nd to 25th February 2021. Today's session, a challenge to innovate. Alexandra Bukla, Amina Saeed, Janvi Prasad, Nick Barley, Sabine Iqbal, and Yasmin El Rafa in conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy. Alexandra Bukla. Alexandra is the director of the European platform Literature Across Frontiers, a literary translator, editor, and curator. She has collaborated with Indian writers and literary organizations for over a decade. Amina Saeed. Amina was managing director of Oxford University Press Pakistan for 30 years. Currently, she is MD of Lightstones Publishers and the first woman in Pakistan to become head of a multinational and to be elected president of the Overseas Investors Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She began the movement of literature festivals in Pakistan and is founder of Adab Festival. Our next speaker, Janvi Prasad. Janvi is a former journalist who began her career with the Pioneer and moved on to electronic and new media with ANI, Reuters, BBC and HTV, HTV Wales. She is festival director for Himalayan Echoes, Mount Festival of Literature and Arts, and has written a graphic novel on young Gandhi. Nick Barley. Nick is a publisher, editor, and festival organizer. He has been director and chief executive of the Edinburgh International Book Festival since 2009. Barley has judged a variety of literary and cultural prizes. In 2017, he chaired the judging panel for the Man Booker International Prize. Since 2018, he has been a trustee of the Booker Prize Foundation. Our next speaker, Sabine Iqbal. Sabine is a senior journalist and author. His novel, The Shortlisted for Dark Lives, first book award. His second novel, Shamal Days, will soon be published by HarperCollins. Sabine is the director of Matrabhumi International Festival of Letters. Yasmin El Rifa. Yasmin has helped produce the Palestine Festival of Literature since She's based in Cairo, where she works with the bilingual newspaper Mada Mas. Her first book, Radius, on account of militant feminist resistance to mass sexual violence during the Egyptian Revolution, will be published by Verso in 2022. In conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy. Sanjoy is an entrepreneur of the arts, is the managing director of Team Book Arts, producers of the Jaipur Literature Festival and JLF and 25 other festivals across the world and is a founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, providing support services for street and working children in Delhi. Roy works closely with various industry bodies and the government on policy issues in the cultural sector in India and has lectured and collaborated with international universities such as University of Chicago, Harvard, MIT Media Lab and the London School of Economics. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please feel free to send in your questions. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel post the festival in February. Sanjoy, over to you. Thanks so much, Suraj. And I couldn't be more delighted than to kick off this particular series with our wonderful speakers. It's that emotional moment when I want to reach out and give each of you a hug because we haven't been able to see each other or even speak with each other over the past few months. So lots of love and, and, and lots of affection streaming towards you through uh, Zoom from Namita and me. Um, this is an important opening series that we, we plan to take forward over the next few weeks. With the advent of COVID-19, every festival and e across the world has had to be canceled or postponed. The impact on the creative and cultural sector has been staggering. We just released the testing the temperature report earlier today, which shows that there's been an 80% impact on the creative economy in India alone. Artists and artisans, publishers and distributors, writers and performers are struggling to find a way to surmount the odds they face every day. But the lockdown has also provided us, provided us an opportunity to think, to dream, and perhaps to realize a new future for the arts and for festivals. I don't know about all of you, but what it did for us is that we stopped having to be busy being busy and just allowed us that time to think and reinvent ourselves back home here uh, at Teamwork. Can we work together to realize this new evolution? 
will bandwidth hold? Will the experience of a virtual festival change the world of the arts? Will technology be able to step up to the table and, and create a new experience? Not in the way that you do gaming or when you wear a, a, a 3D um, you know, glasses, but will it become more tactile in the future? Are there new opportunities? To seek these answers and much more, we've come together with festival heads across the world to discuss, share, and innovate. But before I move to the session, may I please invite Navita Gokhale, uh, who's an award-winning writer, publisher, festival director for the Jaipur Literature Festival. She's written over 20 books, including 11 works of fiction. Her recent novel, Jaipur Journals, was released in January 2020, Betrayed by Hope a play on the tragic life of the poet Michael Madhusudan Tat was published in December 2020. She's a co-founder and co-director of the Jaipal Richer Festival and JBM. Namita, over to you. Hello, all of you. Like Sanjoy, I wish I could give all of you a hug. Here's a virtual one, absolutely from my heart. It's wonderful to be reconnecting with friends, with colleagues, all those who stand by books, ideas, and literature. It's been a time of disruption and challenges, but also of learnings, and more importantly for me and for many of us of unlearnings. We've had to unlearn so much. Digital technology has provided the solace of virtual community, but it's also posed the one question that hangs heavy on the air. And that question is the shadow of AI, the shadow of control. Who is telling our stories? Which are the stories that are forced into silence and amnesia around us? Who has power to, to control, to often distort the dominant narratives that we imbibe? We are each other's stories. Books and ideas endure. They sustain the human narrative. Like all of you, we at JLF have adapted to the times. I feel like an early amphibian, learning to swim, remembering to walk. William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and the incredible team at JLF have together helped to create and sustain three digital platforms. That is Brave New World, not so brave anymore, sadly, we are getting tired. Birds are Bridges, which is about multilingual spaces, and voices of faith. I'm hopeless at numbers, Sanjoy will tell you, but they have done well in terms of audiences and established a distinct identity. Although, of course, revenue streams are precarious, resources are an uphill climb. Our international editions at the British Library in London and at the ones in Houston, New York, Boulder, Colorado, Toronto, so many places. They have reached out to audiences and time zones across locations in ways that the old physical models could not have ever done. We have in some senses built up what I'd call a living library. Yet, I confess even more today with all of you in there in the audience that I miss the old world, I miss the old times, the unspoken human connection, the non-verbal cues that uh, tell us so much. Uh, we live at a time when the virtual world almost seems more real than the physical one. We are each other's stories. Books and ideas endure, they sustain the human enterprise. Like all of you, we at JLF are, are handling on, we are hanging on, we are carrying on. Observing you at your similar endeavors across the world has been inspirational. And all of us have learned so much from the community of those who platform books and ideas it's strange to live and work from a lonely vertical, but we are not alone, not as long as we have books and each other. I look forward to many more collaborations and conjoined platforms and a worldwide web of stories. We can tell our own stories, relay our narratives, listen in and resonate as many voices as we can, wherever, however. And uh, at JLF, our commitment to science to understand the era of change is as strong as ever. So these are the areas we have been treading and I'm eager to listen in to all of you who have uh, done so much in your fields and uh, thank you very much for being with us. 
Thank, thank you so much, Namitha, for that. Let me go straight in and ask Yasmin. Yasmin, will you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, how you've been able to innovate, and some of the challenges that you faced in this period? Yasmin. Sure, yeah. Um, well, we had to uh, cancel our 2020 uh, festival like so many others, but I, we may have been among the first because the festival was scheduled, um, I believe, for the third week of March of 2020. So it was sort of, you know, we kept going with the preparation until it became uh, absolutely clear that there was just no way um, to go forward. And um, the challenges for Palfest, I think, are, you know, very much part of what's so unique um, about Palfest as a literature, a literature festival, which is that it's very firmly rooted in the act of travel. Um, what we do at Palfest is invite um, a group of international writers and artists from around the world to come to Palestine for a week and uh, spend that week traveling throughout the land. Um, so we spend a lot of time on the bus, um, we visit different cities and through that travel experience, um, the guests have an opportunity to witness the diversity of Palestine, um, understand the occupation that Palestinians are living under and connect of course to Palestinian uh, authors and activists both on and off the stage. So this act of, of movement um, and of essentially trying to overcome the restrictions of the occupation and going to different audiences in Palestine who are themselves often unable to travel even within the occupied uh, territories with much ease has been sort of essential um, to Palfest's entire working model since it began uh, in the late 2000s. So we had to think a lot about um, how to try and uh, I suppose, overcome that and produce uh, some kind of work, some kind of content, um, you know, that could still be uh, true to our aims. And, and our, our, our ideas right now um, are very much to do uh, with the theme that we were uh, programmed to cover for 2020. Both 2020 and 2021, actually, were uh, the programming was built around the theme of um, of uh, global sol solidarity and it's specifically South by South solidarity. So solidarity around the question um, of Palestine, but also around different struggles um, against uh, various forms of colonialism worldwide. And so of course, this is a very, very um, live and important uh, series of questions today with all of the different um, political convulsions that we see in various parts of the world. Um, and we believe that it's incredibly important to keep Palestine as part of that conversation. And you know what we try to do is not to have Palestine uh, sort of um, cornered off as uh, some kind of exceptional set of circumstances. What is happening um, to Palestine in terms of uh, the occupation, in terms of disenfranchisement is very much part of uh, various forces of- um, in, in fact, Yasmin, just to sort of interrupt you, um, what we are hearing is that while uh, uh, Israel, the vaccine is being rolled out, this is not being made available uh, to the Palestinian people in the occupied territories. We're also hearing as of today that uh, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu is going ahead with the building uh, in the occupied uh, territories, uh, uh, etc. Are some of these issues now being seen by the uh, Palestinian festival? Is it being sort of reflected there? And are you looking at taking some of this digitally to be able to find a larger audience, uh, not necessarily because of the cause, but because of what the stories uh, that so many people have there waiting to be told. Yes, absolutely. Um, the way that the pandemic has uh, has played out within occupied Palestine um, has a lot to say. Um, and what we're thinking of doing is, in addition to online um, 
uh, online discussions, online panels is perhaps a, a, a podcast series in which we can bring um, our authors and guests, uh, both intended for whenever we can resume uh, our programming on the ground, and and previous um, guests that we've uh, that we've hosted in Palestine, together with people uh, who are currently there to discuss um, various issues around you know cultural production around. Uh, Israel's sort of apartheid uh, approach to healthcare um, and, and various other things. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, Sabine, sure. let me come to you. You, you, you. You're coming to us from a state which has still got some, one of the highest rates of uh, COVID-19 infection. And in fact, while your mortality rate is still uh, comparatively low, uh, you are way above the national and the international average right now. How has that impacted your festival planning, uh, certainly for 2021? And what did you do in 2020 uh, to be able to perhaps innovate and look at the struggles uh, that you've had to go through? Sabine, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm there, right? Okay. Thank you, thank you, Sanchoy, for having me here. And um, unfortunately, MBA for Mount Bumi International Festival Letters has to be um, done in a in a different way, as as uh, in a different format, uh, because a physical festival is not quite possible at the moment in Kerala. And you know, um, I mean, we've been known for our the the, the location and the place, and as you said, the people, uh, literature loving people, and the and the hospitality that we you know we have given to our guests and so physical festival is very important to us and I'm, I'm a tad disappointed i'm an old school uh, festival lover who who wants the physical festival which has in which includes travels and meeting people parties and all that but it is not possible at the moment so we are not uh, having a physical f festival but we will be having an online festival we are having discussions and you know how since matrubhumi is a big uh, media organization we are thinking of uh, ways in which our different wings can be used to put up this festival. So we are we are on the drawing board stage. We in in, a, in, a, in the next week or so we'll have a concrete plan how we're going to do it. But suddenly the festival is on, and of course, yeah, we have. But 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 I, I, having said that, I'm 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 very skeptical about this digital uh, uh, platform because of course it opens new vistas and gives us. Uh, more opportunities, but then for me, a festival is whether I can touch Sanjoy and hug you. You know, that's a festival. That's where the magic happens. You know, Sabine, let me also ask you. You know, Kerala is the most literate state in India. It's got hundred percent literacy, yeah. uh, but it also has a very large uh, non-resident Indian population scattered across the globe, concentrated to a large extent in the Middle East. Tell us, during the pandemic, has this impacted? Uh, the stories that have been coming out, has it impacted publishing? Has it impacted bookstores? Give us a little sense of how this has come to play over the last uh, six or seven months. Yeah, it has affected. Of course, it has affected bookstores. For example, my own book was my you know, dream. That my debut novel was, um, you know, uh, published in February. And Jan, in, in, in March, we have the national, uh, you know, lockdown and there's no sale, you know. So it has definitely affected. I'm a victim. So it, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of bookstores and they said, yes, it's been picking up, but then not to the, to the old uh, you know, glory of bookstores. But then we are hopeful it will pick up. Of course, um, uh, we, we put up a brave face in the beginning of fighting pandemic, but the flake we give, I mean, we lost, I mean, it's gone out of our hands now because of the sheer number of uh, expats who, who started to come back to Kerala from different parts of the world. We can't say no to them. We have to take them in. And then, you know, that's, that's a situation that was you know, so, so that's a situation and we are limping back to, uh, to some sort of normalcy. But a f festival with uh, you know, thousands of people, I don't think it's on the card now. Thanks, Sabine. Well, you know, what is amazing about Kerala, apart from its beaches and its cuisine, is just the hospitality yeah. and, the, and the nature and, and the sense of nature when you get there. And you can't do that on any kind of Zoom yeah. window. Yeah. So you yes. have to do it physically. Certainly not. Yeah. Nick, um, you know, the, the world literally held its breath when, when or, the, or the art world literally held its breath 
when we heard that the Edinburgh Festival, the center of the arts world, was had decided to cancel uh, the 2020 edition. Uh, for many of us, the world came to an end in August. You know, one felt bereft of not being able to go run in and run to a session and grab your seat and then come out and go to a show and then head to the International Festival and go and catch a bit of science. How did you all sort of cope in that period and how did you look at moving forward uh, post this sort of cancellation in, in August? Oh, thank you, Sanjoy. I mean, it, it's lovely to see you and it's lovely to see you, Namita, and, and all of you here today. I, I must say I'm missing you. We so look forward to seeing you in Edinburgh each summer or in Jaipur in January. And you're right, um, the Edinburgh's festivals cancelled in unison. So nine summer festivals all announced their cancellation at the same time. And for Scotland and for the city of Edinburgh, this was a big deal, not just because of the loss of culture, but because of the, of the commercial issues that that threw up. Uh, Edinburgh is a city which is built on culture and festivals as its foundation. And the, the cancellation of the festivals meant the loss of hundreds of millions of pounds of income. The city doubles in population every summer from international tourists and artists who join from all over the world. And so you can imagine the, uh, the gnashing of teeth and the wailing of the money people and the politicians when they realized that we had to cancel. But I think what we as festival organizers had to do was to, to close our ears to that and to think about what really we are, we exist for. And I think that the book festival in particular, we realized that we, what we do is we bring together a community of people who love books, but a, a community of people who need to talk and discuss their place in the world and how books can help us think about that. I call it a community of thought. And we had to try to re create a community of thought in an online form. And I've got to say that um, Jaipur, the, the work you've been doing has been a really great example of exactly that, of creating a community of thought through your, your different platforms that Namata was describing. And in Edinburgh, we tried to do the same thing. And we did it by building a studio in an empty building, which would otherwise have been used for fringe events and two studios, which were in, in enormous spaces where we could have all of the appropriate social distancing and potentially, if the, if the uh, pandemic had pay, played out in the best possible case, we could have had audience members in there as well, but that was not to be. But instead, we broadcast from our studios where we could, where possible, we could bring authors into the studio and film them in a proper TV set. That gave us multiple camera angles. It gave us the opportunity for all sorts of technical innovations, which made the quality of the events really high. And so that was the basis of how we did it. Nick, in many ways, I feel that, you know, the, the, the cancellation of the Edinburgh festivals actually for the first time came home to a lot of the naysayers who used to rail against the festival. The fact that Edinburgh lost approximately 347 million of additional income into the city in August really woke up, uh, certainly your politicians, certainly Fiona Hislop and Nicola Sturgeon, and tell us a little bit about the, the kind of support uh, that Creative Scotland and uh, the Edinburgh, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Scottish Parliament was able to bring to bear on the creative economy and, and to the arts world in Scotland. Yeah. Yes, it's true to say that the, the cancellation of the festivals immediately threw the festival organisations themselves into financial crisis right away. And the Fringe, the Edinburgh Fringe, for example, which is the biggest arts festival in the world, was immediately on, on the verge of extinction. And it, it required a, a large loan from the government, which uh, it, it will have to pay back. But it was nevertheless millions of pounds of, of income which they needed in order just to pay the salaries of the employees. Um, but uh, it took a bit longer, but the, the Scottish government and the UK government came through with a significant package of support for artists uh, across the UK. Uh, overall, it's been 1.5 billion pounds of support for artists and for arts organizations, which I, I have to say, um, uh, the UK government has got many, many things wrong during this pandemic, but that's one thing they got absolutely right. They really 
backed the artists in this period of, of chaos. And that's allowed people to plan and think further ahead and start to, to imagine what we can do as live performance can return. Thank you. I, 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 think, I think what we've seen uh, in Scotland has really become an example of the need to support artists and artisans and how you can kickstart at least, or at least sustain to some extent, uh, that whole uh, community. But I'll come back to you in terms of some of the innovations that you have continued to do. Uh, John, we coming to you. You know, Nick talked about building communities. Now, you have this really bespoke festival tucked away in the Himalayas, uh, you know, which you have to drive out to get there in many hours. Uh, it's small, it's cozy, it's comfortable, it brings together community, it brings together uh, people, you know, who love literature. How did you cope with this uh, in your homestead? Um, uh, thank you for having me uh, today, uh, Sanjoy and Namita ji. Uh, I think it is a historic session. It is the first series, as you mentioned, uh, for 2021 in COVID time. So really uh, privileged to be here with all of you. Um, so right now I am in the mountains. I'm in Abbotsford, Nenital, in the Lake District of Kumau. It's in the foothills of the Himalayas, really. And as Sanjoy just mentioned that uh, the festival is called Himalayan Echoes. It's a boutique festival not more than 300 to 350 people attending it every year. Community is really close knit. Uh, by the end of it, everybody knows each other from the 20 to 25 odd authors that we have from across the world. You know, you, you take something personally, uh, emotionally uh, from them and you want to come back another year. But sadly, uh, uh, this year, it could, uh, 2020 could not happen. Um, but really, um, you know, we are a small festival. We are not a giant like the JLF or, or the Edinburgh Festival. So I think for me, really, um, it was in some sense, um, I would say, I have to admit, it was a relief, really, of not having to go through that rigmarole of those three days of, uh, you know, just uh, high, uh, high part stress, which you have to go through. Um, so I was pretty comfortable. I myself personally, I'm quite a recluse. And this, this medium of technology is really easy for me to interact with and reach out to, to the world as we're doing today. So I was really happy about it in some way that this is going to be a cakewalk. Um, it was easy for me because again, being a bespoke festival, we had about 10 sessions uh, spread out over two days. Um, there was... Um, there was a bit of a uh, sort of a discussion which happened with our uh, found, uh, founder members and our team members. Should we go on the lines of JLF, like the Brave New World? Should we go and do a series over the next three, four or six months uh, and have continuous sessions? Or should we just stick to the format of the three day festival and just bring that out onto our screens for the people? And we chose the latter. We said we must stick to the three day uh, dates that we have uh, put out for the people. And we stuck to those dates. And it was a matter of say three months uh, of hard work, of course, coordinating with, with the speakers, getting uh, them to sort of uh, uh, figure out how uh, we are going to shoot uh, them through Zoom or through Google Meet. Uh, one of the other things which, which we sort of incorporated um, in our sessions was, um, unlike JLF, um, which, was, which is back-to-back -back series uh, through the Brave New World format, I personally felt that it was getting too much to see people boxed up in a window like we are right now, and two people talking and three people talking, and we are supposed to listen, which is interesting. So if you're an author of merit and your international author all eyes are on you all ears are on you and you want to listen to them but what about the second rung or the third rung speakers uh, they really don't get that much of uh, ear time or visual time really people will start watching something else on instagram um, so um, so we decided that why not sort of uh, curate two three sessions in the outdoors um, why not go for a walk in the mountains why not walk around the beautiful lake and talk about the goddess Nanda, uh, Nanda Devi, after whom Nenital is named? 
why not go into into the fields where the farmers are and do a session where artisan cheese is being made uh, why not bring the outdoors onto your screens so have a conversation as well and 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 get to see other things as well so i think we sort of had a mix of a zoom call also a zoom in uh, session as well we had a um, uh, a film um, sort of uh, uh, put out there we had these two three sessions where the outdoors came indoors the environment we spoke about the environment as well in one of our sessions so it was a good mix of those eight sessions spread out over two days um in a matter of four five hours we were done we had some local uh, uh, artists who sort of introduced through their song um they uh, they sang in the local language which was really beautiful and um, so as much as possible i would say in that short span of 5 hours on to the screen so that people don't get bored and their attention span is short uh, when you're on the internet so we sort of had 30 minute sessions quick spans and um, and bang on then it was just over so uh, i think overall for me that experience was um, great it finished within two days but after the uh, event got over i thought to myself i was lying down in bed and thinking did it actually happen <laughs> you know so as sabine is saying that you know the physical intimacy really is so important for a festival to be felt to be remembered and those emotions to come out to meet people to network um, those bonds so that i was left with a feeling of emptiness i have to say so the sessions were good we reached out to a large number of people across india and the world the numbers were larger the hits on the sessions were much better um but it just left me um empty i would say so uh, technology is great it's very comfortable i don't mind doing it again next year it's very easy to do uh, because it is a small festival but um if i have to do another physical one i will do it and god willing i will uh, in 2021 but but janvi uh, uh, what we hear is your neck of the woods nainital is is fairly covid uh, free uh, there has been very few cases that have been recorded there strict access to the state and in some sense you you all are in a bubble um not really we've had our fair share of covid cases here um because uh, locally maybe people not but the tourists coming in or the one odd person coming from delhi who might be a local here coming in and spreading it it's happened uh but the good thing is because we are in a much open space as compared to bombay delhi bangalore which are cities i mean we are open open in a open space there's fresh air beautiful sunshine uh, you can go for the walks wherever you want people are maintaining social distances distancing so um you know the 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 population of population is also less in that sense so you you are getting your space uh, around you to do what you want to do really in the mountains so the uh, so that's one advantage of being in the hills really thank you janvi amina nick talked about the fact that you know when the crisis hit uh the festivals in edinburgh there was the scottish government who immediately stepped in and was able to provide uh, some support uh, you know financial uh, support etc you obviously in in pakistan or we here don't have access to that tell us a little bit about how you have coped and also what has the has this been an opportunity we have found that in this new format it's been much easier for us to have dialogues with writers of pakistani origin or in pakistan without the usual oh if you come here we won't give you the visa or uh, we will beat up on whoever is organizing it tell us a little bit about how you have coped with the situation and if you felt any advantages uh, to uh, covid-19 thank you sanjoy and uh, thank you um, namita for inviting me um well actually you know we unfortunately never got any support from the government for our festival we used to rely on um, corporate sponsors and uh, other such sponsors unfortunately um, they too uh, because of of covid and they because they suffered suffered so much in their own business it was difficult to get sponsors later but having said that um, we, we have survived 
uh, without having had any income this year because we are a very small group. Um, fortunately, our festival was held in the first week of February this year. So we were able to have a physical festival before, before COVID hit, hit us. So, um, however, 20, uh, this year it's going to, it's very unlikely that we are going to have our festival. Um, but um, what we have done is that, um, uh, again, taking a leaf out of the um, Brave New World book, we've got, um, we had a, a single sessions of festivals. For example, um, uh, we had a, a session uh, with um, uh, Dr. Malia Lodi, a, a well-known Pakistan uh, economist and diplomat that was very widely attended. And then we had another session with um, uh, Prince Hassan of Jordan. And I must say, you know, his session was oversubscribed. And this is one of the advantages that we were able to uh, invite him. And he came uh, because it, the session was on Zoom and uh, he spoke brilliantly. So we've had these uh, odd um, sessions on Zoom. However, what I'm planning uh, for 20, for later this year is actually, um, I mean, two things, you know, one is that um, I find that the physical festival is the best way, really. Because I, st I still remember uh, Vikram Seth had come to one of my festivals in Karachi and uh, the room was packed with people. And um, when he walked in, you know, I could, I heard an intake, intake of breath. I mean, people were so thrilled that Vikram Seth is actually there. Uh, I mean, this is something that you will not experience on Zoom. Um, but uh, of course, that's uh, I think for this year, that's a choice we have. And what I'm planning for this year is actually two things. I mean, I want to take advantage of the fact that one can invite people from anywhere in the world and not as uh, you said, Sanjoy, uh, um, you know, bother about visas or other expenses. Um, so we have a wide range of authors to invite. Um, but I've also been advised by uh, quite a few people that we should try and uh, make it because, you know, in Pakistan, at least we feel there's a little fatigue of people uh, attending festivals online. So I thought we would make it more entertaining for people to have a kind of a performance festival. I mean, rather than just panel discussions, uh, we could maybe have um, um, some kind of performance, whether it's poetry recitation or whether it's, uh, you know, dramatized uh, readings. I thought that would uh, add interest and uh, attract uh, people to attend it. Another thing that I'm planning for this year, uh, which will be something new, I feel, is that I'm very conscious of the fact that my festival is in Karachi. And of course, one of the my motives in beginning this festival was that it should become a movement in Pakistan. I have to say that um, I was inspired by the Jaipur Literature Festival. I attended the Jaipur festival for the first time in 2009. And I was so thrilled and so impressed and so inspired that I felt I have to do this. And till then, there was nothing like a literature festival in Pakistan. In 2010, uh, with a lot of help from the British Council, I organized the first literature festival, uh, which was attended by 5,000 people. In 2018, we had 200,000 people. And I felt that, you know, I have learned so much from Jaipur. Let me also share my uh, this with other people in Pakistan. And I tried to make it to create a model. And, uh, and I was delighted that, you know, it spread to Islamabad, Lahore, Gwadar, Hyderabad, Faisalabad, all over Pakistan. It really did become a movement. However, I'm very conscious of the fact that it's still not being held in smaller areas. So my idea this year is to organize it in smaller areas, but again, it's difficult for us to go to all the smaller parts of Pakistan. So what I want to do is to identify some people who can become the organizers and curators and uh, somehow get them, uh, help them organize their own festival uh, and also to encourage them to get the local artists and uh, speakers so that it's not just the big names who attend these festivals, but for every smaller area of Pakistan, especially um, in places like the, in rural areas, rural Sindh or rural Punjab um, or rural um, um, sort of uh, the Akhaba Pakhtunkhwa area 
invite people to organize their own festivals and um, maybe try and raise some funds to support them and train them how to do it. And uh, they, these local festivals will have the, the local art um, artists and um, writers. So that's my plan for this year. <laughs> Thank you, Amina. That was a great story of, of hope in the way that you've been able to work, uh, you know, across with these smaller places. And I think all of us uh, around this table would be very happy to provide any kind of uh, knowledge support in your effort of building it across other smaller places. Alexandra, let me, let me come to you. You know, we've been, of course, in conversation and many different, on many different forums, but Give us a sense of how you and Europe and the literature festival tradition uh, has sort of been a impacted, but also more importantly, how you've been able to move beyond that. And perhaps if you also uh, sort of dwell a little bit upon the collaborations that have come out of this pandemic. Uh, thank you, Sanjoy. And uh, thank you for the invitation. It's really wonderful to be here, but also I have to say that seeing the video um, made me feel really nostalgic uh, because this time, uh, this time every year I would be getting ready to go to India and uh, attend some of the festivals. And um, I have to say that uh, the last visit I made to India was also the last international um, international uh, trip that I, I made last year. So I've been grounded since then. Um, being the last speaker means that almost everything has been said and that, um, you know, there's, there's not that much to add. Um, LAF, you asked about the European festivals, um, Literature Across Frontiers, LAF is um, a, a platform, we're not a festival, we work with uh, festivals and if, um, if anything we are a kind of mini festival on wheels because we, we uh, bring writers to festivals and what we have been doing uh, or we help with duration of programme and what we have been doing in India is that we have been bringing uh, European writers to Indian festivals. We have also been bringing writers and translators together. We work a lot with translators because uh, obviously any literary uh, international work um, has translation at its core. So um, uh, we, our work um, has been very much affected by, by what's happened, precisely because it all revolves around, uh, around travel, around um, our, our motto is making literature travel. So uh, what we do is not just work with festivals, we also uh, organize residencies, um, either on an ad hoc um, uh, basis or uh, we work with, uh, with other organizations on more sustained programs of residences. So what we faced this year was that uh, we, we basically had to cancel everything, like everyone, we had to rethink what we are doing. And um, uh, as Nick uh, pointed out, the, uh, the, the UK and in our case, the, the Welsh government, because we are based in Wales, has been really generous and has responded uh, very quickly to the situation. Um, but at the same time, the uh, obviously the, the usual ways of, of funding have been affected. So there have been various rescue funds and so on, but <clears throat> that um, organizations uh, applied to, to deal with the immediate situation. Um, but we work with festivals. Um, the, the, the festivals we work with really represent a wide range of models. And um, we work with very large festivals, which are city-based like the Passaporta Festival in Brussels or the Cosmopolis Festival in, in Barcelona. And we also work with quite small grassroots festivals, which are run on um, uh, really, uh, 
you know, volunteer um, bases and have ridiculously small, uh, small budgets. But sometimes you see that these are the, the models that, um, you know, are sometimes more resilient. And um, so what has been happening really across the board is, is very much the same. Zoom sessions or hybrid um, programming. And um, in some cases, I would say that, for instance, there has been what, what again, what Nick described, or Janavi, I, I really like that idea of taking the viewer uh, taking the writer and the viewer on a, on a walk. And this is actually what some of our partner festivals have been doing in, um, in uh, the, the, the physical festivals, and then they would do it with the, um, uh, the, the digital way of um, dealing with the situation. Um, I'd give an example of the um, poetry festival in Berlin which uh, also organizes a poetry film festival, the Zebra Poetry Festival, which is a biennial festival. So they're very much attuned to connecting poetry with uh, the visual. And they have come up with a really interesting, um, interesting model, interesting formats, which were partly filmed in various locations and are visually really much more appealing than the talking heads that we have all uh, become uh, accustomed to. Um, we, we generally had to basically, you know, speed up our learning and um, uh, because part of our funding has always come from the uh, from the European Union, and they have they have been always asking the question: How do you deal with the um, uh, with the digital shift? And uh, in the past, we kind of thought, okay, we'll say something, you know, we'll 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 make a few videos or something or podcasts. But now we really had to we really had to address this. So. Um, I think we, you know, we, we're not there. I don't know what the um, what the future will bring because the um, there, there has been this Zoom fatigue. Um, um, we have been able to attend, a, you know, a, a, a number of festivals all around the world, but in the end, you you grow a bit tired, and also the writers become a bit tired. I uh, we have been recording conversations for some of our partner festivals and. Um, I've had writers who said, look, I'm, I'm just completely exhausted, you know, I don't want to do it, I, I need a break. So, um, so I think we need to think um, about um, maybe different formats and um, learn even more about the technology that will enable this. But I absolutely agree that um, the, the, the physical proximity, the um, you know the, the 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 excitement, the uh, the interaction with the audience um, is is something that's absolutely irreplaceable. And also, um, uh, for instance, what Palfest does that they take their visitors on um, both, I suppose, writers and and other people who may be um, uh, festival organizers who visit. And one of our colleagues went, I think, two years ago. Um, that they take them to see the country, to see where they are. I think that's really important. And it's it's something that some of our partners have been doing, um, especially in other parts of Europe. Uh, there's a lovely Croatian festival that literally takes the writers, you know, across the country to different locations and, um, or a festival in, in Sicily that we have worked with, which, um, uh, happens in three locations. So, uh, you know, these are possible, maybe the physical possibilities give us a kind of um, an, an impetus for, you know, how we could be imagining the, the digital future. But um, one thing I want to say, being based in a um, in a location which is very much on the edges of Europe and, you know, on the edges of the world in many ways, um, it creates a situation for you where you uh, really feel that there is a kind of inequality. You're, you're on the periphery. If you want to take part in meetings, if you want to, you know, um, go and attend festivals, you 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 have to travel always. You have to you have to go there. 
Um, and um, I have noticed that it has become much more, um, this situation has, has brought us um, into a kind of um, position of equality. We're all sitting here, you know, at the at at, at our um, uh, at our various devices. It's not always the, the laptop; it can be a phone or whatever, and and we can we can uh, discuss with others. But uh, this is a model that's um, you know good for for meetings, for brainstorming, and so on. But um, I think festivals hopefully will be able to go to a, a, a physical mode again. So, thank, thank you, Alex. I, you know, totally agree with so much of what you said. One of the biggest problems, of course, has been how do you translate? I mean, even with JLF's Brave New World, the season that we started, as Namita said, you know, we're at 4.8 million views with whatever 26 million reach or whatever it is. But how does that convert, you know, dollar to cent? Because we are seeing for every one pound that we used to get in terms of sponsorship, Today, you're getting less than eight pence or eight pennies. But Nick, I, I want to just end with coming back to you for a second. I want to ask you, has this digital format made the author common uh, by making him or her accessible in the very same way that television uh, in many ways was, uh, uh, you know, did to the crown or the queen? Uh, what uh, uh, what we are seeing today. And earlier, it was really the access uh, that different festivals had that say Edinburgh had or any of our festivals had to particular groups of writers, which made the festival special. But today everybody has access and everybody can go online and everybody can listen to Margaret Atwood or Ron Palmer or whatever. So. How is that impact, or how do you see that as an impact on this new world of ours? And when we go back to the physical, if it's about going back as opposed to going forward, what do you think will play out in the future? Uh, these are such good questions, Sanjoy. Uh, uh, really, you've got your you put your finger on it. Um, it was interesting for me listening to some of the other speakers thinking about the difference between online and in real life. And I was thinking about um, Arundhati Roy, who came to Edinburgh in 2019, where she was uh, interviewed by our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. And the, the sense of, of some, an important event happening in front of the eyes of 750 people in that theatre was really palpable. And then in 2020, we invited Arundhati back and she was interviewed by an Indian journalist based in Dubai. Uh, and it was, and she, she was broadcasting from her home in India. Uh, and one of the great things about it was that we could see inside her, in her when she was sitting at her desk, we could see inside her house. So there was something special about seeing inside Arundhati Roy's house. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was clear that, uh, that, that we were not the only ones who would, who would be able to see inside uh, her house because she was doing a number of different online discussions during the course of last year. And then it, it was driven home to me by the writer David Mitchell, you know, the author of Cloud Atlas, and we were launching his novel, uh, Utopia Avenue, last year. And, and he, he said to me, Nick, after Edinburgh, I'm going to do another 20 or 25 events online. And I'm worried because if I say the same things about my characters and if I read the same sections from my novel, and any, any of my super fans who, who watch more than one of my events and see the same thing twice, then my brand as David Mitchell writer gets diminished. So your responsibility, Nick, is to create an event for me which is unique, where I say things which I will never repeat again. And so what we did was, uh, because Utopia Avenue was a, was a novel about set in the 1960s, uh, uh, of London's pop scene, which had some lyrics from songs, so we commissioned a, a singer, a folk singer, to, to create music from the lyrics that had been written in the novel. And he, he turned it into music and we created a musical performance, a one-off. We played back the songs to David Mitchell but of, of the lyrics that he'd written. And it was, you could see in his face the, the, the joy. And you could see from the comments in the audience that they were really feeling this was something special. And that's a, really our responsibility. We, we cannot let our authors down 
by making them so ubiquitous that they're, they're no, no longer special. We've got to take advantage of the access that these, these online events offer, but we've got to keep the specialness of the events we create. And that's down to us as organizers to be creative, to be innovative, and to really do special things with this medium we have. Thanks, Nick. That was valuable. Janvi, Sabine, very quickly, I know we've run out of time, but very quickly, what is the role, therefore, taking from what Nick said of the moderator? And how does the moderator, how do you prep the moderator so that he or she is not just doing a flyby a conversation, but is doing a conversation to bring out something that that speaker or writer has not necessarily delved in before? What is their role? So, um, Janvi, go first. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I can start. Uh, yes. I had mentioned about the two sessions that we curated uh, uh, last year uh, where we went in the outdoors. So one of them was, uh, I did both the sessions because both of them were in Nenital. So I was the moderator for both, both the sessions really uh, because of COVID times, other people could not travel uh, and you had to be there on camera outdoors. So uh, the first session was with Dr. Alka Pandey, who's a historian and she's written about 15 books on, on uh, the Kama Sutra and uh, the Devi, the goddesses, uh, Shiv and Shakti. So um, she is a local of Nenital and she spent about four or five months in, during COVID right here. So she was the right person and easy accessible, easily accessible for, for this session. And um, so we got together, we decided how to sort of curate it. Uh, uh, we went to the location, we went to the temple, which is by the lakeside. This lake is pristine. It's, uh, you know, people used to say in the olden days in the 1900s, it's got magical powers. The eyes of the Devi fell into this lake. So it, it is a story which is, which is uh, connected to our mythology, number one, the Hindu mythology. It's about the goddess, which, uh, which is again very uh, 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 mystical, I would say. Um, plus the people in Plus the people in the mountains, they are great believers of the goddess. They have blind faith in the goddess. The goddess comes into them. You know, they get hypnotized. They have these uh, things called jagars in the evening where a huge gathering comes by and the spirit goes inside one person and it's the goddess talking. So really this was, this was an interesting subject in an interesting uh, backdrop, which was really scenic and, and relevant. It had a mix of history, it had a mix of culture, uh, mysticism. So I, I think that that was really important. And I think that was our best uh, viewed session. So I think uh, that's what how deep one needs to sort of think. And in order to get the attention of the of the audience. Sabine? Okay. Uh, yeah, before I get into that question, I want to say um, uh, one point about the digital festival, because the physical festival is one of the um, effective ways of branding a city. You, you know, we know Edinburgh, we know Jaipur, because part because the festivals uh, these cities host. So when when we have a digital festival, what are we branding? I mean, you know, so we are nowhere. We are from everywhere. You know, so there is no um, a festival's role as a, as a sort of city branding tool is not happening. So that that's why tourism. Departments may not be interested in it to sponsor the festivals because uh, you know they're, they're not branding their city. So that that that's I wanted to make that point because why I'm an old school a physical festival um, guy is one of the reasons is this because uh, festival is all about the cities it hosts it is host. Uh, yeah. The second, as as a moderator, I had my first experience. I mean, recently as a digital moderator with Amitabh Kosh when we launched this uh, the Malayalam translation of his Gun Island. And it didn't do uh, that. Didn't go that well with me because uh, I don't know. Sashi Tharoor was on one side, Amitabh Ghosh on the other side, and me and the translator. Uh, I was all at sea. You know, that's my experience. So I'm not sure, but I'll be talking to my set of moderator when we do the festival. You know, so I'm quite a bit skeptic uh, about you know skeptical about the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, over to you. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Sabin. Amina, very quickly, uh, there's been a question about funding. You're a small group of people running the festival. Have you been able to hold, keep your team together? And how have you been able to fund uh, the team uh, in the absence of any funding uh, as of now? 
how is that how is that managed how have you coped with that al kul amina you are on mute um sanjoy actually um you know i i run a publishing house lightstone publishers and um, the the team is actually our staff who volunteer um for the festival so we don't have a uh, paid uh, uh, paid employees of the festival they actually um employees of my publishing house who are volunteers so that's actually how we have managed to survive um uh, but i just wanted to say very quickly that i am also thinking in terms of a hybrid festival because i feel that it's important to get uh, the panel in one place so i thought that perhaps you could get the panelists together in one place and yet um you know the audience could be online or the audience could also be you know just a small group in a uh, in an outdoor venue i thought uh, that kind of a hybrid festival might um, be might work better than a purely uh, festival online don't totally agree with you with with the jaipur literature festival we found this new restored fort by diggi uh it's called the diggi fort about an hour and a half outside of jaipur where we will be recording some of the sessions live but of course the issue is how do you get international writers to come in the fort is fine as a great backdrop but what do you put into the fort so that that's still a challenge alexander the, again a quick question to you uh you've answered it already in what you in your earlier this thing how many skill share projects have you enabled if at all and in in an age of learning online or be it workshops or master classes well this is a really good question because it's something that we should be doing more than we have um a lot of our time at the beginning was taken up by um you know really redesigning everything uh that we had been planning and trying to bring the uh the writers that we had planned to take somewhere physically bringing them together online uh we've had some meetings with um our partner festivals uh to to discuss um how they have been dealing with this situation and also we are part of a network uh which we uh really co-funded which is a network of organizations that promote their national literatures and provide funding for uh its translation so um so we also have uh had some meetings with these organizations uh discussing uh how they have fared and the impact um of the pandemic on the book market in their country and so on um i have spoken in some sessions uh for book fairs for example most recently um uh, i i spoke at a session at a at uh, on on a panel uh at a uh, sorry not a festival a, a book fair of independent publishers in the Czech republic and uh we also did a session for um a book fair in greece for example so there have been opportunities but uh they were often um um you know generated by the uh, not by us but by, by by the by the various partners so this is really how we work we we respond to requests and we sometimes um have you know brainstorming sessions about common projects but uh, often we would respond to an invitation to prepare a session thanks thanks yasmin last question to you is this the age of collaboration is this the point as sabin said where geography doesn't matter place doesn't matter can we all come together do we have to have geographically specific festivals or can we come together or bond together around causes around the need of the moment and create a larger opportunity a larger voice especially from something that you're coming from absolutely i mean i think we uh we have to be thankful that that is also the advantage of the medium uh that we're left to, to rely on um but also more broadly I mean if the pandemic has demonstrated anything it's that our both our vulnerabilities and our crises but our also our abilities um to come together as communities um you know are all interconnected and th there's no escape from one another um whether it's in terms of the problems that we face or our um you know 
the potential solutions for them. So absolutely, yes. Yasmin, Alexandra, Amina, Janvi, Nick, Sabine, Namita Gokhale, thank you all very much. This is absolutely fascinating. Yes, time is short. Uh, Nick, perhaps it's the time to uh, kickstart the consortium again, uh, bring it back, look at how we can perhaps have authors in specific uh, coming together as a festival speaking, which we can all share and broadcast together. Uh, we will look forward to inviting you back again uh, to our platforms. We're sort of doing it region-wise, traveling across the world to try and get as many voices together. Uh, but much appreciated. Congratulations on all the enormous amount of work that you all have done through the year. More power to you. We know how difficult it's been to sustain, to, you know, to self-motivate, to wake up in the morning, to dress up, get out there and do what we want to do, which has been so important. On that happy note, Suraj, back to you. Thank you, Sanjoy. Thank you, Alexandra Bukla, Amina Saeed, Janvi Prasad, Nick Bale, Sabi Nikbal, and Yasmin L. Rifai for this extremely insightful session uh, and for being part of our virtual uh, festival directors roundtable. And thank you, Sanjoy, for being a fabulous moderator and driving this session so wonderfully. Thank you all. And thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will join us for another such roundtable on Tuesday, 26 January, where directors from around the world will join us to discuss and share their views on similar topics. Till then, stay safe and see you soon. As a lover of books, I really, really appreciate JLF. I love JLF. I come here every year. I attend sessions. The people, the vibrancy, the amount of different topics, the panels, the hospitality, the culture, everything. It's wonderful. I feel a deep sense of satisfaction that the literary scene in India is so vibrant and so alive. We've had writers from 15 Indian languages and uh, most 30 international languages. Jaipur Literary Festival is there so many brilliant things on at the same time that you can't choose what to go to. It's really fantastic. It's wonderful to be here. people be able to just listen to the writers for what they're having to say uh, and enjoy the festival. It's a privilege to be here and the diversity of the programming is great and the standard of the debate is, is very high as well. We learn so much when we're on the panel and we learn so much when we're in the audience too. Absolutely live from the Palace. I am coming from 2007, when I was 7 years from that year I am coming and I love so much, I meet so many authors and it's like amazing. It's really good to see the Jaipur youth, you know, getting so excited for this. passion of the people on stage. They're inspiring all these people. Such an incredible turnout to listen to all these people. I've come to this bookstore four or five times and every time I walk away with another book. I've been to festivals all over the world but I've never been to a festival that is anything like it. It is more, more enjoyable, more exciting, more vibrant and it's free. It crosses boundaries and limits and heritages. And that is brilliant. All the speakers, they made us so much clear and love for the literature more and more. And uh, they updated us that what's the new upcoming. And I'm thankful to JLF. And it's nice to see so many, especially young people, interested in literature. It's amazing to see how many of them just keep coming back and coming back and sitting through all the panels and taking down notes. It's a very great thing to have this festival in Jaipur. So we come here. We get a lot of knowledge, we can cluster the knowledge here. Around six sessions, in, whether it's Samwa, the weather in Charbagh, 
everything together. Isn't it wonderful for each and every one to experience this, especially the ones in school, to know that there is value in books and not always on the mobiles, sticking to it every time. Well, it is indeed the Kumbh of literature. Very pleased with particularly how the performance poetry has gone. It's, uh, it's something I think we've been weak on in the past. Um, we've had some very good sessions from the Arab world, some, some remarkable sessions from West Africa. And what I love about GLF is that it makes space for poetry. Poetry is not often given as much time and love as it gets here. <laughs> Our duty, as we see it, is to bring the world to India and India to the world. The only way to transform societies is through knowledge and through culture. And if you're able to make knowledge accessible to those who don't otherwise have access to it, that in itself is a great way of bringing about change. Maro, hello, 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 hello.